YouTube, this is the Plastic Commando coming to you from deep behind enemy lines. Today we're making a continuation video in the uh, series on house rules for Axis and Allies 1914. And if you have not already seen my previous video on the house rules for uh, German East Africa, I encourage you to uh, take a look at the, the video and and get an understanding and an overview of the rationale for the um, the house rule that is going to be implemented into my game of uh, uh, World War I 1914. And so today uh, what we're going to look at more specifically is in part in the house rule that was explained in the prior video. We're going to be focusing more today on the machine gun and the machine gun, the role that it played in uh, World War I was um, only second to artillery in the amount of deaths and casualties that uh, it caused uh, in uh, open battle. And so because of that, I think it's uh, very fitting, obviously, to um, introduce the use of a machine gun in the game itself. Um, as you know, the, the only particular um, uh, use of uh, infantry men fighting each other, of course, is the infantry unit. Um, however, um, I, I do believe that the use of the machine gun uh, not only provides a, a little more uh, way in, the, in, um, in historical accuracy uh, to the game uh, and the way that uh, warfare was uh, uh, brutally conducted in uh, the First World War. And so because of that, we're going to be using this house rule. And um, uh, just, to, just as a quick overview, uh, at, at or near the beginning of uh, World War I, the Germans were the primary nation that had saw the benefit of uh, machine guns. And uh, at the breakout of hostilities, uh, based on uh, information that, uh, that I've read, and you can certainly pull up on the internet, but uh, you know, according to history, the Germans were the ones that saw the benefit um, with a machine gun. And estimates that I've seen ranged anywhere from uh, approximately 12,000 guns at the beginning of the breakout, machine guns for the Germans as opposed to the British and the French, both who frankly did not um, either see the value of a machine gun in uh, warfare uh, or certainly had not made any preparations. And uh, based on, uh, again, information I've read, the British actually just in years past, uh, or excuse me, in years earlier before the war, um, they, uh, they were actually introduced to the Maxim machine gun, uh, by the, uh, the inventor himself, uh, Hiram Maxim. And, uh, again, at that time in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, uh, the British army, they, uh, they just refused to see the value, um, or just didn't accept the value of it as, uh, I guess would be a proper form of warfare, if you will. So uh, they certainly paid the price at the beginning of the war. Um, the Russians uh, were really probably second, I guess, in terms of uh, the use of the machine guns. Uh, the Maxim machine gun obviously was produced in Russia and, uh, and I think only followed with the Austrian who, uh, Austrian -Hung Hungarian empire that uh, had uh, much fewer machine guns at the beginning of the war, but certainly uh, they did recognize the value of it early on. So I think uh, obviously uh, Germany and, and Austro-Hungary were the two primary, uh, and Russia as well, were the three nations, I should say, uh, two for the Central and one for the Entente, that, uh, that really saw the value of, of machine guns. And of course the British and the French, uh, as well as other nations, were just uh, uh, you know, far behind the curve, if you will, uh, on the learning curve. So, so what we're going to do, uh, I'm going to go through a few uh, scenarios uh, of the use of the machine gun, and uh, we will um, uh, uh, demonstrate uh, 
not only with the machine gun itself, but implementing it within the house rule uh, for German East Africa. So I'm going to run through a few uh, moves as it would uh, typically play out um, with the, uh, the order of play uh, in Africa, as well as the potential for, say, um, uh, uh, United Kingdom to, uh, to bring over reinforcements from India, uh, from uh, naval warships, uh, as well as uh, the potential for France uh, to perhaps get involved in Africa, uh, but at least make some moves uh, that would simulate actual gameplay. So uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, go through a few of these and I'm going to readjust the camera. So we're going to take a very uh, quick uh, pause here and we'll be right back. Okay, we are back. Um, what I'd like to do first is just to kind of go over uh, the general guidelines for the house rule um, in my game and the, with the use of the machine gun. The machine gun will be represented by the acrylic marker, which you've, of course, already seen and obviously detailed more in the previous video, which is available through Historical Board Gaming. And um, the marker itself will be uh, paired up with an infantry unit. So in other words, uh, rather than just place a marker down on the game board in a territory and say, well, that's that's an infantry unit, uh, an, an actual infantry unit will have to accompany that uh, machine gun marker. And the purpose for that is, is uh, during movements and the heat of play, uh, if uh, an infantry unit gets moved out, uh, then all of a sudden we try to figure out, okay, who, who belonged to the machine gun unit uh, then it it would just be easier if an actual unit was paired up with that gun. And also, it, it actually looks better. It looks more uh, in touch with the game itself. So, so for purposes of use of a machine gun marker, um, I'm actually pairing it up with an actual infantry unit. So the uh, machine gun is a defensive weapon only to be used against uh, enemy infantry. Uh, the machine gun has no abilities to um, uh, attack a tank, uh, attack aircraft, uh, obviously naval ships. It's a defensive unit against infantry on land combat. Um, however, though, having said that, if, for example, during an attack, if the opposing side, though, does have a tank, the, uh, the attacking tank rule uh, will apply for absorbing a hit. Uh, so, for example, if, um, let's just say, uh, some hits are made, uh, with the machine gun, uh, one infantry, one tank is on the game board, and uh, two hits are made, then the tank would certainly uh, absorb one of those hits. So to kind of take you through how the marker itself is going to work, uh, again, it's going to be paired with an infantry unit at the time of purchase. Uh, the machine gun marker and unit uh, is able to move in the same manner as an infantry unit on the battlefield map, including by transport ship uh, as well as rail and uh, of course we're not going to get into the use of railway uh, at this point in time but that is a, a rule which I'm uh, working on at this time um, and then unlocking the normal order of play for land combat where the attacking units fire first the defending units secondly fire and then the casualties are removed the use of a machine gun unit will fire first um, and if a hit is scored, then an attacking in enemy infantry casualty or casualties must then roll a 6D, six uh, six uh, one dice, uh, a six-sided dice, and that's going to determine whether or not that particular infantry unit attacking is going to be able to make that attack or not. In other words, are they going to be able to continue to attack, or are they going to get mowed down? So... Um, the way this will work is, following a successful defense by the machine gun unit that hits on a four or less, up to two attacking any enemy infantry units are going to be selected as casualties. And what this represents is the reason there's two enemy infantry units up to, um, if you're only attacking one infantry, obviously one infantry is going to be chosen. If you're attacking, let's say, with four infantry, and you've got one machine gun, as we do certainly in German East Africa, then at least up to two uh, casualties could be hit if the machine gun rolls a four or less. 
And so when those casualties are selected, this is going to represent uh, what I believe to be the costly effect of massed infantry assaults against a heavy machine gun in a fixed fire strong point. And so thus the, the more than one casualty. Um, the attacking enemy casualty is then going to be required to roll a six sided dice. A roll of five or less an attacking enemy infantry casualty is cut down by uh, again, just a hell of bullets across the battlefield. There's no chance for survival at that point in time. If, with a roll of six, if the defending, or excuse me, the attacking infantry uh, each roll a six, then the enemy infantry casualty is wounded and will be placed into a nearby hospital, uh, either in an adjacent friendly territory or transported via ambulance. And again, those are other rules which I'm working on. We're not going to go through that today uh, here in, uh, in East Africa. Uh, but um, the, the house rules I'm implementing are, are not going to be used to say an immediate devastating effect of tube infantry. There is going to be an opportunity, uh, as we'll see in later videos and, and, and in gameplay, that there is a potential that uh, those casualties could be placed into a hospital to be used later on. So. We'll get into all that later, but for purposes of today, essentially uh, a, def a defensive roll of machine gun five or less cuts down the enemy. If it's a six, uh, they're wounded and they have to be evacuated out of that territory. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started. And I'm gonna actually come on around to the other side. Uh, zoom in here just a tad bit as we, uh, Actually, what I'll do, I'm going to go ahead and make the moves that I would normally make with the order of play. Obviously, in order of play, Germany uh, goes first uh, before uh, France and Britain. Um, and so this, this will be considered to be the first round of play for Germany uh, as it involves uh, Africa. And so what we're going to do in the order of play... Uh, I'm not going to go through the purchase of units. Again, this is a simulation only, uh, but I will make movement. So for Germany's first round movement, I'm going to move a unit from Togoland over to Nigeria. And then we're going to, we're going to take over uh, Nigeria from the British. Uh, that'll be uh, a plus one uh, for Germany on the, um, uh, the income chart. And then obviously... Um, Britain will go down, and I am, uh, uh, I'm getting a marker, apologize if I'm off camera, and maybe the voice is not picking up, but we're going to go ahead and put a marker, control marker in Nigeria, and then uh, the uh, shoots trooper unit uh, here in Cameroon, we're actually going to go over, we're going to make a move into Belgian Congo, and again, that will be an increase in the income chart for Germany and uh, and so there's no units that will be activated here from uh, Belgium uh, this is a, a colonial territory and based on the you know the out-of-box rules uh, being a colonial power there's no uh, standing army if you will I guess that'll be activated so so this uh, shoots troop unit will move from Cameroon into Belgian Congo now the um, the units in uh, Southwest Africa, which is uh, one uh, shoots troop of German unit and one artillery, we're going to we're going to leave those in place. And actually, the units in German uh, East Africa, we're going to leave those in place. So they're not going to be making a move on the first round. Um, the um, use of the cruiser, which again I would encourage you to look back at the prior video uh, with the uh, the purpose and the. Uh, uh, the implement, Im implementation of the use of the cruiser. Uh, but uh, for this one, we are going to make a movement. Uh, we're going to move uh, from C-Zone 26, from, uh, 25 around the Cape of Africa, over here to C-Zone 24. And so that cruiser will be in place. Um, and then that is all the movement that we're going to make. There's no combat that Germany is going to um, participate in on this first movement. Okay, so we'll collect income. Again, we're just simulating the, the, uh, the play of game here, so we're not actually going to take the time to get the income collected. 
Now on the, uh, the following turn is France. Um, we'll say France is going to move uh, one unit uh, from Morocco over to French West Africa. This, this is likely not on camera, but it's okay. I mean, we're just moving the, uh, the one unit from uh, Morocco to French West Africa. And that'll be all France uh, ends up doing in, in their turn uh, for Africa. Then uh, the British Empire is going to be next. So uh, what's going to happen in this particular move uh, for the British? <clears throat> the British will pick up uh, units in India. And um, as you know, with the, the opening round, India starts out with six infantry, two artillery. So there's one transport ship, and a battleship, and a cruiser in C Zone 29. And so what we're going to do is we're going to bring two infantry over from India on a transport ship. And we're going to move uh, two spaces into C Zone 26 with the transport. Uh, with uh, two uh, infantry units. Uh, two Indian units that will be coming over from India. And we're also bringing a battleship, which will uh, do shore bombardment. And so uh, with, the, um, um, with the movement phase, we're also going to bring down uh, in British East Africa, we're going to make an attack simultaneously from uh, British East Africa, Rhodesia, into German East Africa. The uh, British units, the Indian infantry, are going to offload via transport into uh, German East Africa. And the, uh, the battleship will do an offshore bombardment. Okay? And the, the units in Egypt are going to remain where they are. Uh, because of fear of the Ottomans moving south into Transjordan and perhaps wanting to come into Egypt. Uh, but the, uh, the unit in Anglo-Egyptian Sudan will move into British East Africa just as a uh, reserve unit. Obviously will not take place in this battle in East Africa. So what we're going to be attacking with are four infantry from uh, uh, the British Empire. Uh, and we're going to be defending in this uh, territory with uh, two infantry units and one uh, uh, German shoots trooper machine gun unit. So what I'd like to do is we're gonna go ahead and uh, roll and uh, we're gonna go ahead and make the, uh, uh, the conduct combat moves. Now, the uh, unlike with the artillery rule uh, where shore bond mark, excuse me, an artillery before the the assault, uh, amphibious assault occurs. Uh, defending artillery can fire upon those uh, hitting the beach, if you will. Uh, the machine gun unit does not have that ability. In essence, uh, the units will get on the beach and we're gonna assume that they're moving into a coastal area and then coming in range to, to an actual machine gun. So, so the machine gun unit against an, um, an amphibious assault will be different uh, than the artillery rule uh, from the out-of-box rules. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and do the uh, shore bombardment. And uh, of course uh, with the battle chart here we're going to put uh, we've got one roll here for uh, battleship uh, shore bombardment and we'll go ahead and make that roll. It's a four or less. And we got a one. So, so we've made a hit and we're going to go ahead and take one casualty from uh, German East Africa. And we're going to go ahead and put him to the side at this moment in time. Okay, now that the uh, shore bombardment is complete, uh, we have uh, we've went ahead and moved the uh, the uh, defending infantry unit that was hit into the uh, defending unit uh, battle board. It'll be a casualty. It will get an opportunity to fire back. Now we've got uh, the four British units that are attacking. However, before uh, the attacker completes his rolls, uh, we do have the machine gun marker unit, which uh, will now uh, roll um, for the, um, uh, the two units. And we're gonna roll a, a four or less uh, for the machine gun unit, defending. 
and we got a four. So with that uh, hit, if you will, from the defending machine gun unit, uh, it will take up to two casualties. So for purposes of this, we're going to assume that the unlucky partners uh, or parties, I should say, are the uh, Indian infantry that just got off the boat. And both of those are casualties. So we're going we're gonna to kind of bring them off to the side right now. And again, uh, per, the, uh, per the house rule, uh, with the, uh, the use of a machine gun, the, um, the two British, uh, the Indian infantry, are now going to have to, uh, to make a roll. And uh, we're going to have to roll a 6D. And we're going to go ahead and roll these two dice to see if they actually survive. A five or less, they're cut down. Uh, immediate death and no chance. A six uh, becomes a casualty. Steel is removed from battle, but uh, we'll, we'll deal with that just in a second. Okay, the, um, the two British infantry rolled a five and a one. Cut down. So these are removed from uh, order of play. Uh, no chance to fire back. So now what we have left is we've got two two British infantry uh, against one infantry unit, uh, or excuse me, two infantry units. So we're going to go ahead and roll for the attacking infantry, two or less, uh, six and a three, miss. Okay, uh, I'm not going to bother putting them on the battle board here, but we're going to go ahead and roll for the two remaining German infantry. Uh, excuse me, which is a uh, three or less. Okay, rolled two fours. All right, so uh, missed. Now, this uh, this round of combat's over. Uh, it's going to remain contested. And so we're going to go ahead and leave uh, these units here. And uh, you, uh, hopefully, were able to gauge the, uh, the value of the machine gun unit in a, an overwhelming force that was attacking in German East Africa, uh, cutting down two of the attacking units, in, in essence, cutting their force in half. Okay, so uh, we're going to go ahead and um, uh, this battle is, is going to conclude. It's going to still remain contested, though, um, and then we're going to walk through a few other steps. All right, it's Germany's turn again. Uh, this would be considered round two. Obviously, we're not going to go food purchase units because none of that would apply to Africa anyway. Uh, so what the Germans will do on this second move, uh, the unit that had previously taken over Belgian Congo is actually going to move into East Africa, bolstering uh, the force of uh, Major General Paul von Leto Vorbeck. And so now the British have a, uh, a larger force to contend with, uh, again with a... Uh, a powerful defensive machine gun unit and um, the the two submarines that um, uh, German submarines that start off in C zone 7 uh, for purposes of this um, video um, we're going to assume that um, they remained in play and they have now uh, made their way down uh, two C zones to C zone 22 and uh, we'll see if we can perhaps adjust the camera here a bit. There we go. Um, C-Zone 22. And so what we're going to do with the, uh, the German cruiser, the Konigsberg, we're going to move from uh, C-Zone 24. Uh, we're going to move two spaces. And we are going to consolidate the German cruiser with those two submarines. Uh, we're moving uh, for purposes of uh, fleeing the, um, the British battleship uh, that had remained in sea zone 26. Uh, it was likely that the uh, ship, uh, excuse me, if we hadn't moved the uh, German cruiser, the uh, British battleship could then have moved two spaces and engaged the cruiser and likely would have been a uh, positive result for the British. So, so we, uh, we have moved the cruiser and now we have a formidable force with two submarines and a cruiser that uh, are in play against uh, French units that if the French decide to move their battleship and a cruiser 
down, then at least we've got a, a fighting chance. And of course, if the British choose to uh, pursue with uh, the British battleship and come on around the Horn of Africa, what we're doing, and again, for one of the purposes of the house rule is, is to tie up uh, much needed British forces as well as French units that otherwise could be engaged in uh, Europe, mainland, uh, the Middle East. And so if uh, we can entice the British player to then follow us, chase us, and then perhaps have the French engage us um, over in West Africa near Morocco, uh, then all the better. Uh, even, if, even if we lose this force, we have engaged enemy warships and taken them out of play um, and hopefully uh, changing up the strategy for perhaps uh, Austro-Hungarian naval uh, ships that are actually in the Mediterranean um, and uh, that can be utilized for a uh, later battle. So, um, so again, we've made that movement of ships and um, those are safe for the time being. Okay, so what, what we're going to do to complete the uh, movement phase uh, for Germany in round two, uh, we are going to go ahead and uh, engage the units in uh, southwest Africa. We're going to move our units into uh, South Africa and see what damage we can get done. Hopefully we can uh, prevail. And so we've got, uh, we've got one attacking infantry unit uh, we've got one attacking artillery uh, however infantry uh, with artillery support uh, will be a three or less and so we're going to be uh, the, the british will be defending on this round with um, defending artillery and then of course uh, defending infantry unit so as attackers we're going to roll uh, two three or less uh, we got a five and a three so we scored one hit and now the defenders roll uh, two, uh, three or less. And they also got a five and a three. So one for one. Obviously, uh, each of us are going to have to remove the artillery, uh, given that uh, we have to leave a, uh, an infantry unit in the game space. So the Union of South Africa uh, will be contested uh, after this round of combat. And um, with uh, East Africa, uh, we are also uh, going to go ahead and engage the, the enemy British that uh, uh, still have this territory contested. Okay, just to continue the uh, round two for Germany in, um, uh, in Africa, we, uh, uh, we went ahead and we moved the uh, German shoes troop unit that was in Nigeria over here to Cameroon and we're going to go ahead and engage the British infantry that remains in the contested territory of German East Africa. Now uh, we're only going to be able to attack the British units with uh, our two infantry. Again the, uh, the machine gun unit is for defense only and cannot participate in the attack itself. Uh, so in the event if we should lose our infantry uh, during this attack, um, the territory is still going to remain contested because we've got a defensive position machine gun unit that will remain in the territory. Uh, then it'll be up to the British if they then want to proceed to um, attack uh, the uh, machine gun unit. So for now, let's uh, let's go ahead. We're going to take a chance. Uh, we're only attacking at two or less versus defending infantry that are at three or less. So let's uh, plan on some lucky dice here. And we got a three, we got a one. So we got one hit there. And the Brits defending at three or less. Wow, two twos. That was a big gamble, big gamble right there. So, uh, okay, we take off one British infantry and two uh, German infantry and again this uh, this territory is going to remain contested because of the uh, German machine gun unit okay it may have been a bit of a gamble but uh, 
in order to, I think, to advance uh, successfully as Germany and Africa, you've got to start taking a few chances uh, while at the same time trying to establish a solid defensive position. Okay, that could come back to haunt me later, but again, it's it's uh, part of the game itself, um, and I, I could certainly have remained there in a defensive position, but then again, run the risk of um, you know additional troops coming into Africa. So I'm okay with what we've got because when the British does attack us again, we're going to be defending at a four or less versus their attack right now at a two or less. I, I think it's extremely unlikely that. Um, uh, the British infantry will attack. Now, they could bring the other unit in from British East Africa, but again, that would be two, two or less versus one, four or less, and if I make a hit, we've got two casualties. So, again, that's uh, going to be a major concern still uh, for uh, the British Empire. Okay, I, I think that's going to conclude the round for Germany, and uh, we're going to pan the camera here ever so slightly over to the German ships uh, that we had moved over here into C-Zone uh, 22. And um, before we get to the naval battle uh, on, the, on the French's turn, they're going to choose to move to the Gold Coast. So what, what France will do, they'll continue to move over. They'll likely take Togoland, possibly Nigeria. So it's going to be up to us to wrap up a defending force. Uh, the Germans in um, uh, East and South Africa and then ultimately try to put up some sort of a defense against the French to maintain uh, some territories and some uh, IPC uh, income that will benefit uh, the uh, war in Europe. Um, so uh, we're going to go ahead and do the naval battle. Uh, the French um, they're going to go ahead and move in their battleship to Sea Zone 22 as well as a cruiser. Uh, for purposes of this video, the, the other French battleship that uh, typically starts there in uh, Sea Zone uh, 15, we're going to assume that that has moved north in a previous round and they're assisting the British. Uh, it very could likely be there. If it is, it's, it's certainly much more of a problem, but uh, we're going to assume that the British had knocked out the British Navy and that British battleship had moved north. So we'll go ahead and just uh, show how this uh, sea battle may very well impact further, uh, further strategy in East Africa. I'll try to zoom the camera in here just a bit. There we go. All right. Now the French, uh, of course, it's their move. They'll be attacking first. Uh, they've got a battleship. And um, with the battleship, uh, they attack on a four or less. And the cruiser uh, will be attacking on a three or less. So we're going to go ahead and roll uh, for the battleship. I'll just switch things right back here. This is the French battleship at a four or less. Got a hit. And this will be the uh, French cruiser at a three or less. Miss. So we've got one hit by the German battleship. Now the defending uh, German units, uh, we've got, of course, two submarines. Uh, they attack at, uh, excuse me, they defend at a two or less. And then we've got the German cruiser, the Konigsberg, which will defend at a three or less. So we're going to go ahead and roll uh, uh, for the submarines as well as the, um, uh, the cruiser. So we're looking at um, three or less and two, two or less. All right. So we got, we got one, three, we got one, two or less. So we got two hits. And uh, we'll just pan the camera here back around. There we go. Okay. So uh, France made one hit. We're going to sink a submarine. And we got two hits uh, on our side. 
the French are going to take their cruiser and they're going to sink it. And then, of course, the extra hit is going to be applied to the battleship. It's going to be damaged. And we'll move the damage marker here. We'll place that right there. So this, how, this is how the result of the uh, fleet uh, stemming from the uh, cruiser Konigsberg that had linked up with the two submarines, the C-Zone 22. This is how the end result is going to look. Actually, put this ship here. Um, France will be calling off the attack at this point. And uh, you can see at this stage how the use of a cruiser uh, has, has again, as we indicated earlier, has drawn out uh, allied ships from the Mediterranean that uh, could certainly be utilized for defensive positions to bolster the, um, the Mediterranean Sea. And now with the uh, cruiser as well as the submarines uh, drawing those French ships out, it's put the French in a, in a much weaker position uh, in the Mediterranean and now of course uh, the Italians will have to pick up some slack which uh, as you probably notice I, I don't have any of the Italian ships on on the water at this point in time but uh, nevertheless uh, as you know with uh, the income in the first two rounds Italy's not un very unlikely going to be buying and putting ships in the Mediterranean now France can certainly add uh, further ships but depending on how the war effort is going on the Western Front, uh, they're likely to be sinking most of their income uh, into uh, land units, uh, infantry, artillery. And so it's going to be unlikely that they're going to spend additional money uh, on naval ships. Uh, could be a possibility, but it, again, it could be unlikely. So, so uh, this, this has turned out fairly well. Uh, we can assume on the following round the French ship will retreat. And so at this point, uh, the uh, French turn is over. And so we're going to go back and do just uh, to complete this uh, round, we're going to get into the, uh, the British response. And the, for starters, the battleship and the uh, cruiser that had uh, made an amphibious, an amphibious assault, excuse me, uh, in the previous round in 26, they're actually going to move back. They're going to be going back to India with the idea of um, linking back up uh, with Indian, uh, Indian proper and perhaps either getting some troops to come back to Africa. And, it, and if so, in doing that, they're going to weaken the number of troops on land that would uh, ordinarily uh, move from India across Persia and into Mesopotamia to perhaps uh, again take on the Ottomans and so it's going to be a choice that uh, will impact the British Empire in how effective they want to launch uh, further attacks on uh, the the Ottoman front so uh, again it's uh, I, I think with this house rule in uh, East Africa it puts the British in a precarious position on, uh, in particular, how developments uh, began in uh, the African campaign for the British. Uh, they got their forces cut in half. They, they failed at uh, taking uh, German East Africa. So they're in a position now. Do they come back with more forces? Again, weakening a response uh, to attack the Ottomans, ultimately allowing the Ottomans to get a bit more stronger. Um, so it's a decision that the British player will certainly have to make. And so in this particular case, uh, just to finish this round up, uh, the, um, the British unit in East Africa, uh, will, will retreat because the Brits do not want to take a chance. Even if, even if they move in the two infantry units, they don't necessarily want to take the chance on getting a four or less from the German machine gun unit and then, uh, more likely than not taking out both units. Uh, again, that would extremely weaken the British position. So they are going to remain in British East Africa. The uh, Egyptian force that uh, remains, the British, uh, they are unlikely to move south. 
um, because the Ottomans, uh, in their turn, have uh, bolstered their position in Transjordan. And so the British uh, have no choice whatsoever other than just to defend Egypt because to move south, again, just to take on a, uh, a very uh, small uh, ragtag force in East Africa would not do them any uh, favors whatsoever. And it would, uh, it would essentially cause the, um, the Ottomans to, to then move into Egypt, take it over, and have a good fixed position, thus controlling the Suez Canal. Uh, on uh, movement of ships. So uh, the Brits are, uh, based on the scenario we've outlined and shown in this video, are in a bit of a pickle, in my opinion. Uh, again, they're, they're going to have to make a choice on whether or not to um, attack the Ottomans, and in doing so, it's going to give the Germans a free hand because there'll be no, virtually no resupply of British uh, infantry and units in uh, East Africa. Um, with the uh, the further rounds that will take place, uh, we're we're going to go ahead and end this video. I, I think you I think you all have got a, a fairly good understanding, perhaps, of how the um, the house rule has impacted the uh, the war effort in what is otherwise uh, and has been just a boring campaign in this game uh, based on out-of-box rules for East Africa. Um, so at this stage, uh, the likely scenario would be that Germany will take over a few more territories. It's, it's very likely they'll take out South Africa. Uh, Germany will um, conquer South Africa. That'll add one IPC. Uh, they can certainly take over Portuguese East Africa. That'll be another IPC, Rhodesia, Angola. And then with East Africa, likely keep a, um, a solid defensive area that could potentially keep out the French. And then again, add just a few more IPCs uh, to the German uh, economy, uh, which inevitably will um, help out uh, the forces that are heavily engaged in mainland Europe and on the Eastern Front. So... Um, I, uh, I think this is going to bring an end to this video. I appreciate those that have uh, tuned in. Uh, again, I have <laughs> unfortunately made a, a rather long video. And uh, I guess the last thing I would say is, uh, which you may have noted, and I just did not put the units on. Uh, we've got, throughout this uh, setup, of course, we've got, uh, you know, the Italian infantry. Um it's it's very unlikely the Italians will will send any sort of um, reinforcement. So there, in my, in my opinion, the Italians aren't aren't necessarily a factor in this. At best, the Italians could uh, certainly move in, help the Brits defend East Africa to keep uh, in some way to keep the Germans from moving north. Uh, but again, I, I think the role. Uh, with this house rule and the likely scenario if it does work out for Germany is to uh, again to keep a good defensive position in East and South Africa um, protect uh, several IPCs that that otherwise Germany would lose just based on out-of-box rules so um, so again I, I appreciate uh, you guys tuning in I uh, welcome any feedback uh, on the use of the machine gun. We, we certainly went through a few scenarios that extended beyond the use of a machine gun, but I, I think the, uh, the main point that I was trying to make, certainly with this house rule, is the, uh, the machine gun itself uh, started off and it really crippled the uh, British attack on East Africa and it set them back. Again, the, the machine gun in a defensive position cut down 50% of their attack force. So in that instance, it worked out fantastic uh, for Germany. And so I think that's uh, going to show you the power of the defensive unit of a machine gun. And um, I'll be making further videos that'll demonstrate more effectively a uh, use of machine gun. Obviously, I'll be putting up a few more videos in the future about some additional house rules, ultimately accumulate, uh, you know, uh, culminating rather in a uh, full-fledged game that I'll try to go through uh, with all the house rules that I've got at this point. And so stay tuned and uh, we will um, 
We'll be back in touch with a few more videos. I appreciate you guys tuning in. This is the Plastic Commando. Over and out.